this edition of Native Report. We visit United Tribes Technical College in Bismarck, North Dakota. We learn about the wisdom of Paul Buffalo, an Ojibwe medicine man. And we learn how entrepreneur James Anderson overcame a speech disorder. We also learn something new about Indian country and hear from our elders on this Native Report. Production of Native Report is made possible by grants from the Shakopee Metwakanton Sioux Community, the Mille Lacs Band of Ojibwe, and the Blandin Foundation. Welcome to Native Report, I'm Stacy Thunder. United Tribes Technical College of Bismarck, North Dakota has its beginnings in 1969 as a training center and predates all tribal colleges but one, Diné College in Arizona. It is an accredited post-secondary school where intertribal unity is its strength and its success. The snow covered the campus of the United Tribes Technical College on this January day. The college has its beginnings as a military fort. The place where United Tribes is as a college and as an organization has a very unique history in that it, it originally was a military fort and it was built between 1900 to about 1910 and it was called Fort Abraham Lincoln. Uh, and it was built in that period of time. It was authorized by the U.S. Congress, and there are many uh, of these types of forts around the country that look very similar with the uh, wide uh, parade grounds, the buildings that's, uh, that are around that parade grounds. And uh, it was a, an active duty military base that trained people that went into uh, World War I, for example, in 1917, 1918. Uh, and in 1924, the uh, North Dakota Army Guard took it over. And then uh, in 1939-1940, uh, uh, INS took it over. And uh, German and Japanese uh, uh, internees were held there, uh, some of whom had been military. But most of the Japanese were people that were, in effect, U.S. citizens and uh, were declared as aliens. And uh, all men were held there. Uh, and so it had that period from there until about 1946 when it was closed off. And again, then later was resumed uh, uh, and occupied by the North Dakota Army Guard as its headquarters. By the mid-60s, it was decommissioned, and the site was used for other purposes until North Dakota tribal leaders united to preserve their civil and criminal jurisdiction. Out of that came this idea that if we can come together, uh, there is the old adage of, you know, there is strength in unity and there is success in unity. And uh, that's uh, the short story of how United Tribes came to be, originally called United Tribes of North Dakota. And we still use that name uh, as part of our intertribal affairs and forum, uh, the annual intertribal summit that we do each uh, fall of every year. But from there came uh, officially in 1968 a charter and that charter was United Tribes uh, uh, of North Dakota and United Tribes Employment Training Center. So we started out as a training center. And what the tribal leaders uh, said at that era is we need a place to educate and train our own people because there wasn't one, at least not in this region anyhow. And we predate uh, all of the tribal colleges with perhaps the exception of Navajo Community College, now called Diné College. Our students come from uh, a wide range of, of different places, uh, mostly uh, from uh, tribal uh, Indian communities, tribal reservations, but they come as far away as uh, California to uh, the southwest, but obviously most of them come from the Dakotas, Montana, occasionally from Minnesota and Wisconsin, and so we will have tribes represented in our student population that will be anywhere from 22 to up to 70 in any one given semester. And many have come here for uh, uh, everything from criminal justice to nursing to construction trades. One of the reasons why United Tribes exists is because 
uh, we wanted to create an access for uh, young Native people, American Indian people, uh, to get in that door. And to, to do that, then they've got to have training and they've got to have some aspect of education because no matter where they go, you know, they're going to have to have that skill along with some credentials uh, to get by in life. And our students do very well uh, in the sense that uh, at United Tribes, we, we basically are a small village, if you want to call it that. Uh, we have a, a pretty good retention rate that ranges anywhere from uh, 60 to 75 percent. And nationally, among all the tribal colleges, the retention rates are much better uh, than uh, students who go to mainstream or non-native institutions. You know, uh, we're lucky to see two to four percent uh, of American Indians graduate from mainstream institutions, by the way. And our graduation rates are, you know, uh, much, much higher than that. Tucked away in the Healing Center is a meeting room that houses some very special photographs from the Fisk collection. Frank Fisk was, was a turn of the century and early 20th century photographer that lived uh, among the Standing Rock Sioux. In fact, he was married to a native woman uh, who originally was from uh, Minnesota, by the way. But in any case, he was settled well into, uh, into that community of, of various villages. And part of the issue is he was a professional photographer. He made his living by taking pictures. And so he took a lot of family photos, a lot of individual photos. He took pictures of some of the chieftains who, for example, uh, participated in the, in the Custer fight. But he did his main focus was on individuals and families. And what we look at in the Fisk photos is the fact that it really portrays uh, the end of the 19th and the beginning of the 20th century. Uh, but what you're seeing is a transition and how Native people were adjusting to change that was so dramatic when their old life was taken away and supposedly a new life was being given to them. And uh, th I think that's the strength and beauty of many of his photos because he brings out that the proud nature of American Indians. The history of Native nations is one of change, and the same is so for United Tribes Technical College and Indian education. Both continue to evolve. Part of the issue for education is that we uh, continue to take hold of our education ourselves, that we begin to grasp and put it in our own hands, as opposed to the traditional philosophy, uh, American US philosophy of them providing the education for us. And we're seeing more tribal leaders begin to take uh, the issue of, of how do we do that? And if we're going to do it, let's do it. But let's put also those values back into the system, along with the critical issues of the skills that each of our our young people need to have if they're going to do well out there because our young people are very, very mobile, uh, just as they were, you know, 100, 150, 200, 500 years ago. So the challenge for us in education, the challenge for tribal nations leaders is to make sure that we provide the best environment we can, a safe, you know, a community, a place where parents and elders and others can go, but mainly where the children and young adults can go for this opportunity called education. Did you know that United Tribes Technical College was founded in 1969 by an intertribal organization? The college is operated by a 10-member board of directors made up of tribal leaders and tribal government delegates. The college was founded to provide a community where Indian people can acquire an education and obtain employment. The brick buildings that house the college near Bismarck, North Dakota, were built from 1900 to 1910 as Fort Abraham Lincoln. During World War II, Fort Lincoln was used to detain German and Japanese civilians. It officially changed its name to United Tribes Technical College in 1987. The college has served over 10,000 American Indian students from over 75 federally recognized Indian tribes from throughout the United States.
Paul Buffalo was a respected Ojibwe elder who had knowledge as a medicine man and spiritual advisor. He died in 1977, but his legacy to the young people of today and generations to come is in the form of a narrative systematically recorded by a college professor. The sharing of this life history is made possible because of a dream that Paul's mother had shortly before she died. Pass on the word to the younger class. Would you like to hear stories, the history school, life of an Indian? Not only Indians, but all in this great country we live in. A lecture to our young people, the words we leave from the old people. It is a remedy to the hearts of our young children. Access to the wisdom and life experience of Paul Buffalo is possible through the tape recordings by Professor Tim Roofs. This story is as much the professor's as it is Paul's. It was all by accident or preordained, depending on how you, how you look at it. I and about six other graduate students at the University of Minnesota were up in northern Minnesota training to do ethnographic field work to go to other places in the world. And as part of that, we were doing a series of community studies and studies on activities in northern Minnesota, including powwows, wild racing, and, and the like. So I, I, I volunteered to do the, the ball club powwow to me, which my Norman days. I sent a letter during the winter time to the ball club council, uh, to Wayne Cronin, who was chair at the time, and asking uh, permission to come, so thanking them for the invitation. And they got the letter, read it at a meeting, put it up to a vote, and for one of the rare occasions, there was a dissenting vote in the council. Everybody voted in favor of me coming, except one guy, Paul Buffalo. Paul refused each request for an interview by Professor Roofs, but observed what the professor was doing from afar until one day. Paul Buffalo came up and said, Mr. Roofs, can I talk to you for a minute? I said, sure. He said, you know, I've been, been following you around and talking to people what you're doing. And he said, my mother dreamt that you would come and write things down. And before she died, she told me, a book writer, a writer will come asking questions, and when that writer comes, you tell him everything. And he said, I've been talking around, I've been asking people what you do, kind of questions you ask, and I, I believe you're the person my mother dreamt of. Now, her dream would have been in the late 30s, it would have been before I was born. For the next 12 years, regardless of Professor Roof's questions, Paul would often talk about what he wanted to talk about. Yeah, I'm just telling you what I, what I learned from John Mitchell, that you asked me. So that's what I'm telling you. My history of life, that I'm 71, 70 years old and at 71, going on 71. Uh, I think uh, I should be able to pass the words on to the people of our time, of our Indian way of life, which we enjoyed in the past. Well, I realized that after about a year and a half that, that he was doing this on his schedule, and he would normally, we, we would normally record some things, he would then wait, he'd go back and talk to the elders. Uh, he would see what I, about the transcriptions, I would normally transcribe the tapes, bring them up, he would read every page of them. And if it was okay, we'd go sort of to the next stage. 
Yeah. No, by the time we were done, he actually had recorded four and a third miles of audio tape. And some of it was recorded at three and three quarter inches per second on the old time equipment. And that resulted in, in over 4,000 pages of, of transcripts. About 2,000 he, he read himself and, and okayed it. From that, we, we condensed all of that into three volumes. The first volume is a, a, a book on his early life from the time he first remembers it, from, the t from, from, from a ceremony that he underwent when he was a child, through one seasonal cycle. The second volume deals with his tales and stories that he heard in his lifetime, as well as myths and legends. The third volume deals with the coming of the, the white people into the area that, that he grew up with. Paul's narrative covers 70 plus years from when he was a boy growing up in Leech Lake and covers many topics that Paul did not want lost to history. We talked about that a lot. And he said, there are some people now when I talk aren't, aren't so interested in, in, in listening to what I have to say. But he said, sooner or later, people will want to know about what it was like in these days. And he said, he used to say regularly, uh, you know, Tim, I'm not so special. All of the old timers we know could tell you the same kinds of stories, but he said they won't talk. They don't want to talk for one reason or another. And again, he would say from time to time, I'm telling you this because my, my mother told you, my, my mother told me that you would be here and you should write it down. And he said, I'm giving this to you to give it back someday. So, his prophecy of people wanting to know this in, in a way has come true in a way he, he couldn't have he couldn't have imagined. Over 700,000 people have viewed the transcripts on the University of Minnesota Duluth website and Paul Buffalo's wisdom and the wisdom of a people lives on. The man is living his life. The way you live and the way you believe it. The way others believe it, other than you. The man is living the life of the whole world. My grandmother told me, not speaking English, not having an education, not doing any of those things, she said, mother law is the most important law of our people. And everything in mother law has to do with uh, that you pass on what's in your DNA, you pass it on. You gift it to the boys, to the male in your line. You gift it to them, but when they get married, whatever they, pass on with the female in their life, it's the mother law that carries that. So the boy, the, f the male of our species are very, very important to us as, as female because if you look at demographics across the world, you're going to find that there are more women in the world than there are men. And when my grandmother would tell me, you need to um, take very good care, always respect take care of the males in your life. Could be your grandfathers, your grandpas, your uncles, your dad, you know, your brothers, your sons, your grandsons, whatever. She said, take good care of them because they're a gift to you. Overcoming a speech disorder was a turning point for James Anderson. The son of Dave Anderson, CEO of Famous Dave's Barbecue, was by his own admission a shy youngster who would stutter and stammer when he felt under stress. Today, James is a published author, a trainer, a speaker, and an inspiration. 
that a son is able to do this for his own father. And with that, I bring James Anderson. Bonjour, Amin. Good afternoon, everyone. Long, long, thank you, thank you. Long before... The self-confidence that James Anderson exhibits when speaking in public wasn't always there. Growing up, he hid behind an invisible wall, shielding his lack of self-esteem. I never realized that I was shy or anything like that until really middle school when I just, I started playing small and I stopped wanting to do well in school and um, I was just scared. I was living a scared uh, life. But it really, it came to a head when, when you had to take mandatory public speaking class. and. Basically, I stuttered through the whole semester giving my speeches and it wasn't a big deal. Nobody laughed or made fun of me or anything like that. It's just what James did. It's just what I did. And the final speech of the year was your top five memorable moments from public speaking class. And I gave my speech. Everybody gave their speech. One of the, f the last people was kind of the class funny guy. And uh, he wasn't an enemy of mine or anything like that. We weren't good friends either. But he got up there, and his number three top five memorable moment from public speaking class was James's verbal clutter and stuttering. He accepted the notion that he may not possess the best speaking skills, yet he was a student leader while in high school and college. I was challenged by my coaches to say, hey, you need to be more of a vocal leader. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. And, uh, and I had to think, because I was a smart kid, but I'd use my smarts to, to pump up this wall of, of n no self-esteem. I, what I did is I said to this young, this young high jumper, this was in college, I said, hey, you know what, I, he, he was, he was going to be captain next year. It was, it was pretty much sealed up because he was good, he was a good leader, and I said, hey, you, sh you should do this. You should do this. Why don't you come up here and lead everybody? Kind of looked at me, uh, the whole team looked at me, uh, what's going on here? I just, oh, you lead it, you lead it. And he did, and it, uh, I played it off as, I'm developing the leaders behind me. Who can argue with that, you know? That all changed with a phone call from his dad. He said, you got to go to this Tony Robbins thing. Well, who's Tony Robbins? Well, he's this, pers this professional development, personal development guru. You'll love it. You just got to go. Oh, I don't, I don't want to go. Take, see if you can get your time off because you're going. Uh, it's in Denver. You got to go. I was like, fine. I've never been to Denver before. I'll go. There I was. Outside the, uh, at the Denver uh, Convention Center, where there was 600 people just waiting to get into their big auditorium. And inside the doors, you could hear mm, 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 the be the bass going on. I was like, and people were at the doors pounding to get in. And I was like, what is going on here? Robin's presentation made a huge impression upon James. He thought about the missed opportunities. The third day, all of a sudden, I'm looking around, and once again, I, I look around. All these people are just into it. People have had breakthroughs just as I have, and they're starting to talk positive and strong. You could tell they've changed just by how they're holding themselves. You can see it in their face. I'm like, I'm looking around. I'm probably only, I don't know this for sure, but I'm pretty sure I'm the only American Indian in this audience. And I'm like, how can we compete in today's world by not hearing these messages? Us Native people, we have opportunities too, but it's our thinking that, t that, that hurts us. And that's not just Natives, it's all people. So I want to develop world-class leadership trainings, workshops, and keynote speeches, and bring world-class, because that's what Tony was. People were paying $600 a seat just for the cheap seats. And so this pe big money people were coming to this. So, so I said, I want to do this, but I want to do it in a level where us na Native people can, uh, it aren't priced out of it, that they should hear these messages. So that's how the Life Skills Center for Leadership was created. Today, James is a motivational speaker and a trainer. He cites his father as being a champion in his life, but he also recognizes another hero who made an impact upon him. My grandpa, uh, Jim, he's full-blooded Choctaw from Oklahoma, and I remember growing up him telling stories of school and learning and how 
when he was orphaned by the BIA and sent to Haskell School for Indians. Whenever he, you know, when we know the, the horrible stories that come out of there, beaten for speaking their language, cutting of the hair, all these just horrible stories, I didn't hear those stories from him. I heard, all I heard from him about school was the value that he learned. And there is no greater strength than the, abil ab the ability to, to let go of your anger for the betterment of those who are coming behind. For more information about Native Report or the stories we've covered, look for us on the web at nativereport.org. Thank you for spending this time with your friends and neighbors in Indian Country. I'm Stacy Thunder. See you next time on Native Report. Stacy Thunder is a member of and legal counsel for the Red Lake Nation. And Tad Johnson is a member of the Boys Fort Band of Chippewa and is chair for the American Indian Studies Department on the campus of the University of Minnesota Duluth. of Native Report is made possible by grants from the Shakopee Mdewakanton Sioux Community, the Mille Lacs Band of Ojibwe, and the Blandon Foundation.